I uh, apologize for the, uh, the separate video interruption there. I had some uh, some student uh, uh, come in, need some assistance, and then phone calls from, from uh, Dr. New. And so now we're back. Uh, I'm back talking about um, organization or the lack thereof uh, in uh, West African organized crime. And this is uh, talking about the master-apprentice relationship uh, where you have the individual gets very successful that type of crime, get some junior, young, junior or younger family members uh, involved uh, in the organization, and then those, they, those individuals then uh, become apprentices. There is, uh, if, if the operation becomes large enough, they may bring in people from outside the family, personal acquaintances, but usually those are only hired on an ad hoc basis, they're hired uh, for individual purposes. They might get hired as mules uh, or get hired for specific tasks, uh, but they're not permanent uh, members of the organization. This makes detection by law enforcement difficult uh, because uh, you know these one-time ad hoc employees, when they're caught, they don't have any information. You know, they can be interrogated all day long. Uh, but generally, they don't even know the real identity of the person who hired them uh, to do whatever their task was. Uh, and so uh, law enforcement has a hard time uh, dealing with these groups. Uh, additionally, they are much like other organized crime groups. Those uh, junior family members that are brought in are sworn to secrecy, uh, generally told, you know, if you break the rules, uh, we're going to take it out on your family. The other thing, the other thing about organizations, because these are small, we're talking about core of the group being three to five members, uh, as far as permanent organization, and then any number of uh, ad hoc employees. Their small size keeps them from drawing the attention or the ire of the large organized crime groups, because they're not really cutting into the profit margin uh, of the larger, you know, this Russian mobsters or the Sicilian mafia. Uh, and so they don't really draw the attention. Uh, they also find they make themselves very useful to these groups uh, because these smaller groups, sometimes they can get into places. The large groups can't. Um, and so I want to finish this talk by talking about some of the different types of uh, crime that the organized groups, these, these criminal groups, again, it's up to you to decide whether or not they're truly organized crime. Uh, talk about some of the things these groups get into, uh, different types of crime. Uh, primarily, we'll start with their, their big claim to fame, uh, which is drug trafficking. Uh, really, drug trafficking in the regions probably been around since the 1930s. Uh, at least that's what the, the German authorities will tell you. Um, but really, the Nigerians uh, get a lot of the blame. Uh, when it comes to drug trafficking in West Africa, uh, countries like Ghana and Sierra Leone uh, point the finger uh, at, 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 at Nigeria and say in the 1980s, the Nigerians, they started the drug trafficking, it's all their fault. And all the drug trafficking that happens in our country uh, was because the Nigerians brought it to us. Uh, and so the Nigerians, and of course the Nigerians are still major players uh, in the drug trafficking through the region. Uh, not drug production, but drug trafficking, and of course some local sales. Um, but primarily there are just several good ports and places in Nigeria that are really good transfer points uh, for narcotics. Um, but really all Western, while Nigeria is still amazing, a good player, all Western African nations uh, get used as traf traf transfer points for uh, narcotic smugglers. Um, for specific drugs, uh, cocaine uh, tends to come through the Cape Verde Islands, uh, in, in your Ghana, and then through Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, uh, and then from there into Spain, Portugal, and the United Kingdom. Uh, heroin, on the other hand, usually comes out of South Asia into northern North African countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, and then into Cote de Vion. Uh, and then points in Europe and the United States. Um, when we talk about Nigeria, Nigeria really, they get the bad rap. Um, and Nigerians, as a result, tend to get some bit of, uh, uh, what do you call it, profiling. 
Uh, in fact, the Dutch police, uh, at one point the Dutch police decided to run a little experiment. Um, and you know, normally, you know, in the, in the airport in Amsterdam and other places, and, and, and there are the Dutch police there, uh, their pattern is randomly stopping individuals. Uh, during one 10-day period, though, they decided to, uh, because they every time they catch a Nigerian, most of the time they would have drugs, and so they got this idea, so, okay, well, what we're going to do for 10 days is every Nigerian person holding a Nigerian passport uh, that comes through the airports, we're going to stop them, and we're going to search them. No randomness at all. And so over this 10-day period, uh, they end up searching about 83 Nigerians. Uh, 63 of them were transporting drugs. Um, these guys, uh, the Western Africans, particularly the Nigerians, unlike other organized crime groups, uh, they tend to work, deal in smaller amounts, uh, transported by mules. Uh, they don't seem to have uh, the resources. The larger organized crime groups, uh, like the Sicilians and the Russians, uh, or uh, the Japanese or the triads have uh, for moving drugs in large amounts. Uh, but they tend to move a fair amount of drugs just through small amounts at a time. Uh, so let's see, some other random findings uh, in the research about um, West African drug trade. Um, many of these uh, Western nations not only are involved in drug trafficking themselves, uh, but find themselves to be used as a base by larger organized crime groups. Um, by that I mean by non-African uh, organized drug traffickers. Um, there are uh, a lot of West African groups are uh, this way because they're very successful uh, in corrupting uh, government officials. But also, I would also note for you that there are no really, no, there really are no large cartels uh, when it comes to the drug trade through West Africa. Uh, let's see, the next crime I want to talk about is internet fraud and, it, and what they call advanced fee fraud. Um, and this was a big deal. I mean, in 2003, uh, a bunch of nations uh, at one conference uh, where you had 138 nations represented, 122 of them uh, complained about Nigerian mail fraud and advanced free fraud. Um, this is more popularly known as 419 fraud. Um, and this is, it's named after the relevant section of the Nigerian Criminal Code that actually makes such behavior illegal. But what it is, is an, uh, basically attempts to obtain prepayment uh, for goods and services that do not exist uh, or that the procurer does, does, has no uh, intent to deliver anyway. Um, typically, it involves a proposal. Uh, for some involvement in an illegal scheme, uh, such as money laundering, and then when the victim knowingly gets involved or agrees to participate, uh, law enforcement tends not to care. Uh, at least, you know, at least that's the way it, it has been in the past. And, and yeah, I'm willing to put good money down to bet that almost all, if not all, of you have experienced uh, the 419 scam. Um, if you've gotten any, if you've gotten the, one of those emails that starts out. Um, you know, my dear friend, uh, my name is blah, 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 I'm the president of such and such bank, um, recently one of my clients, such and such, who was so and so famous person, or so and so government official, uh, has had a large, a large, had a large amount of money, uh, this hundreds of millions of dollars, in a bank account, and he has no heirs, and I've got this plan to get, to shuffle the money out of my bank and into your country, and if only uh, you would set up, if you would only set up an account and put X number of dollars in it, uh, and, and, and I will handle the rest, and I will transfer all this money uh, into this account you make, uh, and then and then we'll split the money, and you'll get you know you'll get the big share. Um, and then you know there are people that are stupid enough to fall for that. Um, if you've ever gotten the email that says. Uh, you know, my name is uh, Princess So and So from such and such African nation, and you know my father is, uh, uh, is you know president for life So and So, uh, and you know if you'll just marry me and bring me over, and I'll bring my vast fortune with me, and I'll share it with you. Uh, just please send me X amount of dollars uh, to bring me over. Um, what are some of my other favorites? Um, you've won the British lottery. Uh, you just need to send us the money for the taxes. Uh, stuff like that, and I'm sure you've got at least one of these scam emails. 
Um, and I'm, and I, am, I am positive all of you uh, in, my, in this class uh, are smart enough never to have fallen for one. But the reality is there are gullible people out there. Uh, there are uh, people that uh, suffer from greed and gullibility. Um, you know, people who that has that empty place in their heart that you know, are so desperate to fill it that they're going to take a chance on some of this thing that feels sounds too good to be true. Uh, and they fall for it. And the police, when they fall for it, they say, you know, you are agreeing to uh, money laundering and, and we don't really care. This is <laughs> too bad, is, is the typical response. Now, police in recent years have started paying attention to victims because sometimes by paying attention to these victims, even though these victims, so-called victims, were agreeing to money laundering, um, sometimes the police will help out because if they can catch the scam artist, uh, they might also have ties you know, to catching uh, a drug smuggler or human trafficker. But, you know, you wonder how, I can't, sometimes you wonder, I can't believe uh, somebody would be uh, so ignorant as to, as to fall for something like this. But the reality is, you know, if you average, if you figured out the average loss for all internet fraud of all kinds, the average loss is about $435 U.S. Uh, the average loss to Nigerian fraudsters uh, is about $5,500, almost $5,600 U.S., um, you know, in 2002, uh, U.S. citizens lost in total about $1.6 million uh, to these 419 scams. Uh, you know, and these are, uh, these are usually 419 scams, usually uh, it's run by a group of about two to five individuals. Uh, unlike, unlike a lot of the other uh, schemes and things that are done out of West Africa, um, these require some a slightly more sophisticated kind of individual uh, because you need, uh, at least the planners need to be individuals that are knowledgeable about email protocols uh, and email transactions so they can make these things uh, traceable. Um, they require individuals that are fairly knowledgeable about the relevant government and business practices. Uh, these are individuals that tend to have connections with attorneys, and so uh, they tend to be a little more sophisticated than your typical drug trafficker. Probably the best story I read about in planning for the lecture um, had occurred uh, in the last decade. Uh, the ringleader of a particular scam, a name Emmanuel Nwede, uh, N-W-U-D-E, uh, this guy was, uh, it formerly had at one point been the member uh, of the board for the Union Bank, one of Nigeria's largest banks. Um, and him and his buddies, uh, some of his, uh, his co-conspirators, uh, you know, had, had played the part of Nigerian government officials or bank officials or Nigerian governors. Um, they really put on a really good scheme. They went to Brazil, uh, went to Sao Paulo, uh, and persuaded a Brazilian banker in Sao Paulo that they were working uh, with several banks to fund uh, the construction of a new airport in Abuja. Uh, and um, he showed them architectural designs and, fit and falsified government documents. You know, it had these guys that pretended to be government officials and just really pulled the wool over this guy's eyes. Um, and this Brazilian banker actually invested uh, $240 million uh, to, be, to go towards the construction fund for this uh, new airport that didn't really exist. Uh, the kicker for this... Um, he was caught because the $240 million that he took out of his bank, he had done so illegally. Uh, and so not only did he manage to look foolish by being uh, scammed out of $240 million, uh, but he went to prison for uh, illegally absconding with $240 million of a Brazilian bank's money. Oops. Oh, see, other crimes out of South Af Western Africa include human trafficking. Uh, three types of human trafficking out of Western Africa uh, include agricultural slavery, uh, particularly uh, Western youth from we other Western, Western African nations, uh, but also um, youth from other parts of the world, uh, including some places in the Middle East like Lebanon. Um, second type of human trafficking is 
Uh, West Africa becomes a transfer point uh, for illegal immigration. Uh, you know, folks trying to get out, you know, paying uh, these traffickers to help them get out of uh, China and other parts of Asia. Uh, they tra tend to transfer uh, in uh, various parts of Western Africa. And then third, there's a large sex trafficking uh, uh, market, uh, particularly in Sierra Leone and, and Nigeria. Uh, Sierra Leone uh, tends to sell young teens uh, to uh, wealthy business owners in Lebanon, while the Nigerians uh, tend to sell their young people uh, in Italy and other places in the Middle East. Let's see what's next. Next is... Uh, Map. Um, other things that occur in Western Africa include diamond smuggling. Um, maybe you've probably heard about, you know, uh, what they what sometimes refer to as conflict diamonds. Uh, these, um, you know, in Sierra Leone, uh, there is a, you know, a mass quantity of particularly easy uh, to mine uh, diamonds uh, that are both high in quality and easy to, and easy to mine. Uh, deficiencies in government policy make it very easy uh, to smuggle uh, these diamonds in and out of Sierra Leone. And really the profit is uh, not from the illegal mining, but the export uh, to wholesale uh, distributors and gem cutters. Uh, these are folks around are you know folks all around the world, but particularly a lot of these conflict diamonds end up in Belgium. Uh, one of the one of the strange one of the th things though is this uh, this illegal diamond smuggling uh, is an export business while it comes out of Africa tends to be uh, dominated by non Africans uh, and it is also often used the diamonds are often used by rebels and terrorist groups in Western Africa um, you know, used to finance their operations. And other organized crime groups, non-African organized crime groups, tend to use these diamonds uh, as a form of money laundering. So they use the diamonds as a form of currency. Let's see, just some generic other crimes used in Africa. Forgery, um, uh, fairly good at uh, forging passports and travel documents. About two grand a piece will get you all the travel documents you need. Um, a lot of cigarette smuggling uh, goes on. Uh, particularly uh, a lot of inter-region, uh, a lot of smuggling within South, within Western Africa, uh, largely because of the high taxes placed on cigarettes in Sierra Leone. Uh, there is, because the banks uh, in Nigeria and other parts of Western Africa are, are rather corrupt, uh, you can guess there's a lot of money laundering going on there. Uh, quite a bit of arms manufacturing and trafficking in Western Africa. Um, several Western African countries, especially Ghana, um, have uh, groups that just manufacture and smuggle drugs, or, uh, drugs, smuggle guns uh, for uh, various revolutionary groups. Uh, you know, warfare prevent, prevent, prevents opportunity for arms smuggling. Uh, what I find unique about uh, Western African organized crime is that these groups are not just trafficking the drugs, they're trafficking the guns, uh, they are making them. Particularly, they are fairly good at making shotguns, revolvers, and recreations or replica recreations of the AK-47. Um, in fact, all ten of the regions or sections of Ghana have firearms manufacturers in them. Uh, they tend to be small shops that make about 200 weapons per year. Um, but overall, you know, these uh, each there are a lot of guns coming out of this area uh, being made there. Despite the fact that weapons manufacturing in Ghana is illegal, the weaponsmiths have, have somehow managed to make a living anyway. Uh, let's see, and then finally there's something called oil bunkering. Uh, you can read about that in your textbook. This is a specialty of Nigeria. Uh, this is the illegal export of oil with about 300,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, this is probably the most sophisticated and organized of uh, the organized crime activity in Western Africa because it requires... Uh, it, it is muchly dependent upon uh, corrupt public officials uh, and the people who feel like they're not getting uh, the benefit of oil trade. 
and so they, they, they help with the oil bunkering. Uh, make sure you read uh, what Dr. Roth has to say about oil bunkering. And uh, again, that's, uh, that's all I got to say about that. Um, I might add another video later in the week about crime in the Caribbean. Um, haven't quite decided if I'm going to do that or not yet, but I've got some stuff. Uh, I've got you some supplementary stuff to help you with, uh, um, help you with the exam. And I think, uh, I think I've added some fairly interesting stuff for you as well. And so maybe another video later in the week about uh, Caribbean crime. Maybe not. If not, uh, we'll talk about terrorism and organized crime next week.